for the purposes of documenting and updating. Thank you so much for clicking on this video. I appreciate that you joined me on the patio. I'm going to be clearing a few things up as well because finally one of my Brassavola species orchids bloomed and all of a sudden all these questions arose in my head. Who are you? Was there a switcheroo with the labels back in the day? So we're going to start with Brassavola subulifolia. You'll see on the tag that it is cordata. Well, it is a synonym cordata. It is actually Brassavola subulifolia. Both of them can be correct. However, I will stick with subulifolia. And this is not an order of from worst to bestest. <laughs> it just so happens she was in the viewfinder. So we're going to start with her. She did not do well in Lekka and self-watering. I had her in that setup for quite some time. She did bloom beautifully for us, but then my circumstances changed and I stopped using heat mats. If you want to know more about Brassavolas and their roots, the life cycle of their roots that I have studied and then was able to draw some conclusions, well, I'll link that video in the description as well as the general care for Brassavolas. So two videos in the description if you would like to have a look. And it was this orchid that pretty much helped me understand stand evaporative cooling and Brussels wallers are warm to hot growers if you don't provide them with nice warm feet all year round they're not going to appreciate it very much and the roots will be history relatively quickly and Brussels wallers are also not happy root growers so my subulifolia was the first candidate that went into lava rock with self-watering to get away from the evaporative cooling that I have to deal with during the winter months that decimates the root systems of Brussels wallers and I do not have have all my Brassavolas in lava rock. I have four of them in three different setups and I shall explain as we progress with the video. Anyway, so she was pretty much a problem-free orchid as Brassavolas are considering that there are species not happy root growers. They're not really that difficult to grow if you can maintain a humidity of 70% and higher throughout the year and maintain temperatures no lower than 15 degrees Celsius. So since she's gone into lava rock, this orchid has pretty much done absolutely nothing, which could be concerning, but the key word here is nothing, because that includes that she is not declining either. We always assimilate nothing being she's not progressing, but we also have to look at an orchid that is very, very set back and say nothing is a good thing because she's not declining. While she has absorbed her back bulbs, that is to be expected with something that has such tiny structures, not many storage organs, and still waiting to see if she is going to manifest a new growth at the base. I have some form of an eye at the base. Whether it's going to amount to anything, I do not know, but for the time being, at least we have the right conditions that these orchids like at this time of year. And with conditions like, for example, I have today, I have 32 degrees Celsius in the shade and 20% humidity. These orchids are struggling and it is up to me to keep the mist going, to keep the ambient humidity high around the orchid in the hopes that the roots that are left and viable in the pot or mounts, as you will see, will not turn into oregano. So this orchid was not mislabeled. Happy days, moving on to the next one that I have potted up. And this is my Brassavola flagellaris. She was one of the ones where I did the tag switcheroo and I was much confused. And this video is clearing all of that up. So this one turns out to be a flagellaris because when she blooms, she blooms with several blooms on a spike on an orchid that is well grown and established, which I managed to achieve in the first years she was with me. And then I moved her from Lekka and tried something completely different because, you know, example of my subulifolia, I moved her from Lekka into sponge rock only. Everybody always says Brassavolas grow best when they are mounted, but once again, if the conditions are not conducive, the temperatures not conducive all year round, then sometimes we have to resort to potting orchids up. And for that reason, I tried sponge rock and she is doing absolutely brilliantly. The reason I went with sponge rock is also no evaporative cooling and a lot of air around the roots that do make it into the pot. 
And based on the progress of the structures over the years since I put her into sponge rock, clearly there is some activity in the pot doing their job very, very well, might I add. And this year, after a couple of years of a break from blooming, we did get some blooms with several blooms on a single spike. And this one blooms for a very long time. In my dry climate, I managed to have blooms for approximately eight weeks, which is insane because these blooms are super duper delicate. And you would think they would frazzle out relatively quickly, but nope. And then she promptly is starting on her new growth. And oh my goodness, because I do a lot of misting at the base, I support the growth so that it at least gets a chance to harden off at the base and not kink, get damaged and then fail. So flagellaris does have a kink in its growth from the pseudobulb to where the leaf comes out eventually. But in my circumstances, I prefer to keep that new growth as propped up, as upright for as long as possible until everything has hardened off before I let it go pendant. <laughs> So we are a long ways off of this new growth maturing, but it's looking once again very promising and eventually more roots will be in the pot and all the moss that you see on the top, that grew all on its own and I'm leaving it because once again, it helps with the humidity around the orchid in my extremely dry climate. And then we had another switcheroo. When I received my Brassavola perinei, I also received my Brassavola tuberculata <laughs> and somehow the tags got mixed up, but who knew? until one of the two bloomed and it turns out that I actually did three switcheroos so the flagellaris we saw previously is now correctly labeled whereas this one that I always thought was the flagellaris is the perinei. <laughs> I know it sounds a real mess but when you get the same species orchids with similar looking structures while they're somewhat in seedling stage ah, it can happen but because of the experience that I then had with the leka I thought my now perinei should definitely be in ceramis it's also water retentive and there's a a lot of air around the roots but she didn't do very well in that at all and then I moved her onto an inorganic mount. If you find this all a little bit strange it would not surprise me one iota because this is a bit strange but in 2020 when I started my channel I wanted everything to be inorganic and as cost effective as possible so we started with inorganic mounts which I have a complete playlist of if you would like to see the then the growth and the now and that is where I put my perinei and she did really, really well. However, her roots are not really branching roots and they were always reaching for something that wasn't there, as in humidity. You see, they didn't grow up. They went in the direction where they thought they would find more humidity and that was away from the light and the heat. <laughs> so enter a mega mount. And yes, I know this looks very odd. I have gotten used to it but I need all this to stay on because I am very, very respectful of Brassavola roots, seeing as they have a limited life cycle, so every single root counts. And putting it on a huge cork mount like this was the only solution for me not to destroy what roots had grown into the hob filter material that I use instead of sphagnum moss. The progress of this orchid has been sensational. It's only this year now that she has come out of her funk from being mounted, even though I didn't disturb the roots. Last year, she was a little bit on the stalling side of things, but now she's going absolutely nuts. I already have four mature growths of the season of 2024. We are not done yet. There's at least three more coming. And she has been a reliable bloomer for me prior to me putting her on the cork mount until she got her bearings again. So I'm hoping that this year we are going to see her blooms. I only ever get one bloom out of a single spike. I think that's the norm with perinei. So I'm also taking this opportunity to clarify that the Care Collab video I did for Flagellaris, it featured my perinei. Let me just say the care is pretty much the same. So it's not like I'm going to take that video down. But if you ever see that and you see me talking Flagellaris after you've seen this video, I don't want to confuse you. That was always my thinking that this was the Flagellaris. Well, here we are. I'm just clarifying. <laughs> The footage that you're seeing with me misting this orchid would be the third time within four hours because of the dry air. So my Brassavolas really struggle. They keep me super busy during the best time of the year when they are in active growth. And of course, what is really annoying me is to see new roots growing and they're not going down towards the mount. 
there will be aerial roots that once again are just going to be sticking out and they're extremely firm so it's not like I can push them down gently like you can see I'm trying to weave them down into the hop filter material it is very difficult to do that because they have no flex in them even when they are much much longer you have to be super careful with brassavola roots and you can really see in this example that they don't produce many roots per new growth but I'm so glad to see that she is doing so much better than she was last year and then I have finally identified my zombie rhizome the image of April 2022 is after she grew some new growths but before that I had mounted her on this inorganic mount it was just a rhizome with a couple of new growths starting no roots at all I couldn't believe the revival of this orchid coming through with four new growths out of a single rhizome without any roots. So if you have a tuberculata that is struggling, <laughs> here's hope because that's why I call this my zombie rhizome. It isn't anymore. And then this year in 2024, four years after putting it as a zombie rhizome on my inorganic mount, it bloomed. And that is when the whole unraveling started because now I was confused. And I want to say a massive thank you to everybody that contributed to the identification and unraveling of the spaghettiness of Brassavola species that I have to identify this one as the tuberculata. Then I went onto the internet to check about the perini I, then I matched all the blooms and this is the result. They are finally labeled properly and moving forward I can with confidence identify who's who and tell you a lot more about them. So the growths that you see <laughs> are the two new growths of 2024 and uh, I'm scared <laughs> because the growths that you see prior that are a little bit darker green, one of those actually bloomed for us and now the new growths haven't even finished growing. They're not mature yet and they have more than doubled in size. <laughs> This is insane, but I am loving it. But I have to say that I am... <laughs> I'm busy. With my brassavolas, I am super busy when it comes to keeping them hydrated. And even now when it is so hot, I rarely use fertilizer because I do not want to burn the roots. So in conclusion, I have an image with all the blooms of all my brassavolas where you can see how they are identified via their bloom shape. The subulifolia is pretty easy because it has more cluster of blooms. When you look at the perinii, the flagellaris, the tuberculata, if you were to look at them very, very quickly, you would think they're all the same. At first glance, anyway, you would think they're all the same. But upon closer inspection, you can see that the petals and sepals of the perinii are a little shorter than the flagellaris and the tuberculata. And then you can also see the comparison between the flagellaris and the tuberculata. You would think these two are the same if we eliminated the perinii because, you know, petal length. Now the bottom two, they look the same, but now check out the lip. The flagellaris is rounded off at the bottom of the lip and the tuberculata is shaped into a V down at the lip. And then we can be really, really picky with the way the petals and sepals of the tuberculata are more narrow at the base, with the petals being much higher up and a straight line across, as opposed to the flagellaris having a little bit of a downward curve. If you look at the curve from the left tip of the petal all the way to the right, you can see there's more of a curve. The tuberculata is a little bit straighter. <laughs> I know, I know, but this is important because I don't want to put out misinformation. <laughs> So I appreciate that you stuck through the video with me. Thank you so very, very much. If you have any questions, check out the videos that are linked in the description or ask away in the comments. I appreciate you watching this video to the end. I get to wish you a beautiful day on the condition though, please, that you stay safe. Take care. Bye.